So again, I'm going to say good evening to everybody and welcome to our uh, remembrance of the perfect storm 30 years later. My name is Joe Deli Carpini, <laughs> an operations officer, and along with me is Bryce Williams, one of our meteorologists. And uh, we're going to take you through the presentation tonight, followed by a weather briefing afterwards. So, uh, Bryce, I will go ahead and hand it off to you to start. All right. Thank you, Joe. Um, thanks everyone for joining tonight, and I am excited to talk about this this storm. This is uh, one of the bigger storms that, that is anybody's memory up here in New England, and uh, for me, it, it's it's a neat storm. It has been a neat storm to learn a lot more about in doing research for this presentation. Um, I'm not from originally from New England, uh, from Tennessee, um, and also I was I was only one when this happened, so I was actually introduced to the idea of this because. It's uh, as as you all, you all um, likely know. It's it's actually been adapted into a, a film back in two thousand. Um, so that brought a lot of it a, a, a worldwide attention to to it and the biggest story to come out of it, which we'll talk about. So that was um, a, a, it's a pretty fascinating and unique part of this uh, anniversary compared to a lot of other our storms because there's not a lot of uh, storms that we talk about that have movies um, depicting the events of them uh a big hollywood movie so um pretty uh pretty interesting uh system and uh fascinating human human interest stories that went along with it as well that we'll talk about so looking at back at the um we're going to start with the impacts of the storm before joe gets into the meteorology of it so just a, a quick uh one pager on the the highlights of this storm how so first talking about how uh, strong were the winds with this thing so the, the strongest wind we recorded was at Chatham, which we had a 70 mile, 78 mile per hour recording. Um, at Thatcher Island, 74 miles per hour. So hurricane strength and above um, for this uh, system. 68 at Marblehead, 64 um, even as far inland as the Blue Hill Observatory. And 63 miles per hour at Newport. So um, hurricane force wind gusts with this system, even not even just along the coast and over the ocean where the, the biggest impact was felt, but even inland. Uh, be, and beyond the winds, we also had coastal flooding um, and extremely rough seas, which were one of the most memorable things of this system. Waves, we, we, see, we saw waves 10 to 30 feet high um, being very common, actually, not just a one-off, but lots of 10 to 30 foot high waves all the way from North Carolina uh, to the, the coast of Nova Scotia. And in Massachusetts, 25 foot, rate, foot waves reached the shoreline. Um, on already high tides, so unfortunately the, high, the, the tides were already four feet above normal. And so at Boston, the, the tide reached 14.1 feet above the mean low water, um, which is just a, a, a measuring system of, of the tides. So 14.1 feet, and that is about a foot less than we had seen with the blizzard of 78. Um, so these treacherous swells, the surf, and the coastal flooding uh, we were, were recorded uh, along portions of the Atlantic shoreline, all the way from Puerto Rico uh, to the Dominican Republic, to the Bahamas, and the U.S. and Canada um, in, into Bermuda. So extremely far-reaching effects of this uh, system, or systems, you, you, you could call it, because it, as many know, it, it was a kind of a combination of multiple storm systems that all uh, combined into one perfect um, situation. All right, so... It, um, it, it, it had a very unique track. You can see here uh, with the red arrows pointing to the track of, of so this is a map of the, all the tropical cyclones in 1991. And you can see the loop-de-loop uh, -loop that, that this system did as it grew and combined and formed and transitioned from subtropical to tropical and back. It did this loop off the coast of Nova Scotia, retrograding back towards the, the east coast towards the, the um, New England coast and then to the loop and then back up north into to Canada. So this system was called, you know, the, the most common name is the perfect storm, but also for obvious reasons, it was called the, the Halloween storm as well because it, it, it occurred right around Halloween. And then also uh, one that I wasn't familiar with, I learned doing research for this uh, was that it was an, uh, called the unnamed hurricane. Um, and, and we will, I think, Joe, get it, get into the reason for, for that in a little bit. All right, so before we talk about uh, exactly how high these waves were, just a little background on wave terminology and what these uh, words that I might say mean. 
So the wave height is basically just the height of the wave from the trough to the crest. And you can see uh, depicted here on this image from the trough where the, the wave dips all the way to the peak of it. That's the wave height. Well, the wave length is from crest to crest. And so what we use as meteorologists when we're forecasting for wave height and also observing wave height is called the significant wave height. So this just means basically the average height of the highest one third of the waves. As you know, if you've been on a boat, you know, not every wave is identical. They're all, they're all different. And so we have to measure, say we measure 100 waves, the highest 33 of those we would take and we would average the height of the highest 33 that would be the significant wave height. So basically, um, what you could expect to be the, the generally that the highest uh, wave height you would encounter on the, whatever seas you're on, that would be the significant wave height. There, there are waves higher and waves lower, but this is the average of the top third. So rogue waves are something that were very common with, with this system, and they are overall, a quite uncommon and elusive phenomenon to to see and to to observe or to to, to be measured especially um, or recorded but basically they are just a defined as a, a wave that is two to two and a half or 2.2 excuse me times the significant wave height uh, so you can see the picture there on the right is a, a road wave off Charleston South Carolina coast and it's it's if you imagine it's moving away from the picture from where the picture is being taken so it had just uh, they impacted this ship and it's and it's exiting off so it's kind of hard to see how big it is but uh, you can kind of see looking at the sea around it that it's much bigger than than the rest of the sea and the, and the waves around the ship so in in the perfect storm in this system rogue waves were estimated to be as high as 80 to 90 feet which is pretty incredible and which is became uh, the, the idea of a rogue wave that became became uh, much more mainstream as with the release of that movie uh, because it featured a, a rogue wave very prominently. So the seas were observed in this storm to be as high as 100 feet in the North Atlantic, which is hard to imagine and just incredible, and why, why this, this storm goes down in history is so memorable. All right, so some data to back this up. What, what did we see on some of our buoys? Now, unfortunately, our system of buoys is, is when you look at the whole Atlantic, is, is rather sparse. But fortunately, we do have some, you know, way out near Georgia's Bank, some closer to shore. And this one near Boston recorded a maximum wind speed of 63 miles per hour and a maximum wave height of 17 feet. So very, still very impressive for, for that close into, uh, into Boston. If you go down to Nantucket, uh, oh, excuse me, this is a Georgia's Bank uh, buoy 44011. Uh, the maximum wind speed was 75 miles per hour, so solidly into category one hurricane and the max wave height was 39 feet. And remember, that's just waves that happened to hit this buoy. So, you know, like, like with these rogue waves, there are certainly waves to that 80, 90, 100 feet range out there that just weren't, didn't impact a, a buoy because you look at the map on the left and you can see how much open ocean there is without a buoy. But, but this particular buoy measured 39 feet, which is all, still pretty incredible. We go to uh, Nantucket Shoals. Uh, you can see on the map there, well south and east of Nantucket, uh, we had 76 mile per hour winds and 31 foot high waves. All right, now if you look at the, this buoy way out, even past George's Bank to the East Scotia Slope, this is where a, a buoy actually uh, uh, observed a wave height nearly 100 feet tall. So this, um, so th with this system, it, it had a huge envelope of 50 knot sustained winds. So that's already, you know, you, when you think when we think of, of strong winds, oftentimes we think of gusts. But when you're talking sustained winds, so constant winds of 50 knots or, or or higher, that's pretty pretty incredible. And so this this sustain this envelope of sustained 50 knot winds covered portions of the Atlantic south of Nova Scotia for almost 24 hours. So that was one of the the also unique things of this system was the sheer length that it lasted. Um, most of these storms at this latitude are moving very quickly. What's one of the, the characteristics of hurricanes that we get in New England, as opposed to the, the same systems down in the Gulf, 
they're, that are moving quite slow, they tend to speed up as they're moving up the coast. And so they are in and out. And it's been the case with a lot of our tropical systems recently. They're in and out in 12 hours, sometimes uh, less. So very quick. But this actually, uh, uh, you can see that interesting track. It hung around for almost 24 hours. And so it was unusually long. Um, and so the peak waves in the vicinity of this storm uh, were greater than 60 feet for at least 24 hours. So imagine being out on, the, out on those waters and, and having to navigate 60 foot waves for a day or more, um, you know, pretty difficult to, to think about. So supposedly, you know, when this happened, when this occurred, this was to be, oh, this is a hundred year event. In other words, this event, which should be, would be expected to happen every hundred years, but that didn't really pan out. The name uh, turned out to be a misnomer uh, because later in, only two years later, uh, the so-called superstorm also produced peak uh, wave heights to near 100 feet on the Scotia Slope. So uh, quite a busy early 90s period for out near the Scotia Slope, it seems. All right, bringing it home back onto land for a little bit, or at least closer to land to where we actually saw impacts. Uh, a lot of people saw, saw more impacts. So looking at how the crests of the tide, the coastal, the coastal flooding, the storm surge, uh, not storm surge, but the coastal flooding um, compares to historic crests from the system. And it is historic at some of our locations at Boston Harbor. It's actually been uh, beat by, of course, you see the blizzard of 78, but also uh, four, three other storm systems that had crests higher. We were at 14.14, and that puts, us, puts this system at number five on our historic flood. Uh, range still in uh, moderate flood stage. Excuse me, just below moderate flood stage. Now, okay, now we're going down to Nantucket. This is what I was thinking we were at earlier. Um, Nantucket is where we did see that historic flooding here because the the um, number one crest, historic crest, remains unbeaten by this storm in 1991. And it's, uh, it is still not in major flood stage, but in moderate flood stage, um, but quite impressive to be still number one 30 years later. All right, and then just wanted to show some, some pictures of, you know, of how it was felt on the ground and on, along the coast of Massachusetts. So these are some pictures from Situate, and you can see, um, you know, with this, with this system, uh, the, the most, uh, uh, coverage is, you know, a, a given to the mariners and the people that dealt with it on on the sea. But the people, the buildings and structures and boats along the coast also got battered. You can see houses. Uh, this structure um, is is destroyed on the left. Boats thrown in up out of the ocean onto the shore and into buildings. Um, and just these huge wave heights towering, you know, over. And you see a street lamp there for for reference of how big these these waves are um, crashing into into the coast. Wow, and then speaking of kind of getting perspective of the waves uh, crashing on the coast, you see this from Revere, uh, this, these just huge waves towering almost um, as they're crashing, you know, reaching you know, the tops of these houses along, along the coastline and flooding um, streets and roads uh, all the way up to, you know, like, like you see this car up to these car's headlights um, along the coast of Revere. All right, now down to Gloucester, you see how it, how the, the the angry ocean just had a heyday with uh, these roads along the coast, just totally destroying the roads, um, destroying parts of these houses. This top upper right picture, you can see half of this house is uh, at least half this house is uninhabitable. Walls taken down, roofs collapsed, and then this house on the bottom left, totally, uh, almost totally gone, uh, facing the wall facing upward, and you can see that you know the inside of a house looking more like the outside here on the bottom right. So. A very, uh, very strong storm as, when it comes to coastal uh, impacts on, on structures and roads. Now to Martha's Vineyard, down to the, to the Cape. Uh, you know, just some, obviously this, these are some older black and white pictures, so it's not the clearest to see, but you can just, you can see that the angry ocean all the way up, um, you know, surrounding this house. Uh, you can see the flooding at the, over the piers, uh, you know, standing water on top of the piers and um, just the 
the angry ocean, the, the large waves uh, impacting this pier all on the top left as well. Um, so just all the way up and down the coast. All right, so uh, now onto the, the most uh, recognizable uh, impact of this storm was the loss of a fishing vessel uh, named the Andrea Gale. And so this was a 72 foot uh, fish, fishing, fishing vessel, had a six man crew aboard, and it was presumed that it sunk sometime after midnight on October 28th when the storm was still intensifying. So not at its peak yet, on, on its way up. But the last position it was reported at was about 180 miles northeast of Sable Island. And the emergency beacon was found um, washed ashore on Sable Island uh, several days later on November 5th. Um, and, and as I said, this was um, the, the basis of a, a book actually first called The Perfect Storm. And that was then adapted into a film in the year 2000. Another, um, and it's been a while since I've seen this movie, but I believe this story was covered in the movie. Do you remember, Joe? Yes, it was. Okay, I thought so. So this, another another story from this storm was uh, the Coast Guard cutter Tamaroa, I think, I, I hope I'm saying that right. That's correct. Uh, okay, cool. So the Tamaroa was a, a Navy ship um, built in 1943 um, in, to tug uh, a towing tug for damaged World War II warships. So that was its original intended purpose, and it was retired from that job in 1946. Um, so and given to the Coast Guard as a surplus vessel into their into their fleet. Um, so by the time that the, uh, the the perfect storm came around, this ship was already uh, almost 50 years had already had almost 50 years in service. So it's very old, and it. Because of that, you know, it wasn't. It didn't have the latest, uh, you know, technology. It wasn't. It wasn't the best equipped to handle the, these really rough seas. It was 205 feet, um, and it, like you said, it was, it was antiquated, and and that presented uh, many challenges to the crew. Um, that would be less difficult for a more modern twist screw vessel. Oh, excuse me, twin screw vessel. All right. Uh, so so uh, basically. Uh, this ship was used as a rescue ship. Um, it made several rescues during the storm. Uh, one actually involved a national New York Air National Guard uh, H-60 helicopter that was returning from its own storm-related mission. Um, so the aircraft was was low on on fuel and it couldn't get it couldn't uh, make contact with the uh, refueler in the air. So it ended up actually having to ditch into the ocean about ninety. 90 miles south of Montauk, New York. And so then the crew uh, was picked, was uh, in, the, in the ocean uh, and tried to get picked up by an air station Cape Cod a helicopter um, using, you know, an air drop, an air lift, but the storm, the, the, the wind and the, the waves were too much for that to work. So this uh, ship, the Tamaroa, was called in and um, uh, it was able to actually you know, rescue these rescue these people. So that so you can see a picture here of uh, um, the Tamaroa and its inflatable raft in the red there, um, and it, it, that's a picture of it rescuing three people um, on board. And that was about seventy five miles south of Nantucket during the storm. And Bryce, just this is an actual photo of the um, the rescue of the sailing vessel. You can see that's a two hundred and five foot ship, and you can see how small it looks in those. Wow! Yeah. I, I was wondering. I was. I was wondering. I was, I, I, this is a real picture. I, I was surprised they actually. Yeah, had a, the first picture. rescue before um, the the Air National Guard. This was a sailboat that was um, offshore of Nantucket. They did one of the first okay. rescues. So this is a photo from that. So wow! Uh, yeah, that's pretty impressive. It really puts it. Yeah, it really does put it in perspective. So basically, after um, a, a four-hour trip, um, Commander Brudnicki looked out, um, and he said that he um, could see wave tops towering over the ship and sweeping over the, of course, over the deck and over the, the crew. Um, and so he tried many times to position the, the cutter up sea of the survivors so that they could actually drift down towards the, the people that needed to be rescued because fight, he was, it was so difficult to fight the, the waves and the wind itself. Um, and it took them about two hours, but they were able to successfully rescue uh, three of the crew. Um, and unfortunately, unfortunately, there was one uh, pararescue man 
Rick Smith that was not rescued. And he was uh, never found. Um, and there's that same picture again. So pretty, you know, pretty uh, incredible story. A um, couple of incredible stories um, out of that, that, that storm. And luckily some that had a good ending as well. So uh, that is uh, all I've got. So I will pass it off to Joe to talk a little bit about the history and background. Okay, thanks, Bryce. And if you want to start sorting through the questions, that's fine. We'll we'll definitely answer most right. of them. But just in case, Sounds I don't good. want to leave anybody's question unanswered tonight. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at the storm itself. So um, starting on October 28th, this was um, the weather map from 2 p.m. Um, and you can see low pressure was uh, had formed east of Nova Scotia. It was actually a cold front that had moved through. And um, you can see on the map, there's a large high pressure system over southern Canada. So we're in a nice, dry, cool northerly flow, pretty typical fall weather. Um, so this low formed along the front, but meanwhile, you've got Hurricane Grace, which will obviously come into play. I think many of you are familiar with that, um, to the west of Bermuda. So these are the two features that are gonna come together um, along with the third to, uh, to actually form or really intensify um, this low up here, which looks fairly weak at that point. Um, so just to show what's happening above a little bit, this is at about 18,000 feet. And, and if you've been with us before, you know, this is kind of our steering level for, for storms. Um, and there's a few things going on. First is this um, trough or a dip um, of in the eastern part of Canada in the northeast. Uh, and this is called what we call a digging trough because it's sharpening. And there's a reason for that. Um, you've got um, a, a big ridge here or a big kind of bump. Uh, in the flow across the Great Lakes. So the more this strengthens and moves up, the more this trough is going to deepen and strengthen what will become the perfect storm. And why is that strengthening? Well, it has to do with the, the flow out over the Rockies, this trough deepening. So think about if you're pushing down in the Rockies, you're forcing this to go up, and then in turn, you're forcing this to go down. So um, that's kind of a complicated way of saying we have a strengthening uh, trough here in the east um, that's going to help strengthen our storm and which will eventually become the perfect storm. So there are three things at play here. One is this deepening trough, the other was the low itself, and the third was the contribution from Hurricane Grace, which we'll show. So the next day, October 29th, you can see the low is a little bit more formed now. It's a little bit deeper. It's down to 987 millibars. It was over 1,000 millibars, so it's strengthening. You can see it's now attached to the front, um, pretty far offshore. We have high pressure here over the Northeast. Again, it's pretty nice weather, fall weather, temperatures, look like they're in the uh, the upper 40s. But now you can see Hurricane Grace um, has moved to the northeast of Bermuda and looks like it's starting to become absorbed into this front, which it eventually will. Um, and usually when we have you know a tropical system merging with the front, the front always wins. Um, it'll disrupt the hurricane circulation and uh, the moisture will still be around. And at this point, um, you know, the moisture is starting to converge uh, into the coastal storm, but Hurricane Grace is eventually going to start to weaken here. So again, 987 millibars, so on the barometer, that's 29.15 inches, which is a decent storm already. And this satellite um, picture shows the two features pretty well. Um, you can see Hurricane Grace here in the black circle. You can see it's no longer circular. You've got all the enhanced or like warmer colors, the oranges and the reds kind of on the north and the east side of it. And this side's kind of exposed. It's not a complete circulation anymore, but you can see all the moisture going up across the Atlantic into the Canadian Maritimes. And meanwhile, um, what will become the perfect storm here is located well off the coast. Um, you're starting to see some of the moisture wrap around the western side of it. Um, and this is cold air coming around on the southern side as well. So it's starting to strengthen, um, but you can definitely see Hurricane Grace is becoming less organized. So now we go to Oct October 30th, and uh, the storm has drifted a little more to the southwest. And at this point, it's reaching its peak intensity. It's just shy of uh, 972 millibars or 28.70 inches on the barometer. That's a pretty strong storm. Um, you can see Hurricane Grace has now been completely absorbed. Um, at this point, we know uh, several vessels nearby reported winds of 50 to 60 miles per hour. The buoy out in George's Bank, uh, which is out here that uh, Bryce showed earlier, has gusts of 65 miles an hour and the significant wave height of 39 feet. So um, rogue waves, you roughly double that. So that's 78 feet, figure 80 feet for rogue waves at this point. So you can just see a very broad circulation um, around the storm. And this is what gives us what's called, called a long fetch, strong winds over a large part of the ocean. So it's directing that wear right here um, into Massachusetts and Southern New England. So all the wave energy 
is traveling east to west around kind of the northern side of the storm. So you, you can um, pretty easily see why we had such destructive waves along the coast. Now, on October 31st, we're on Halloween. Um, the storm has weakened at this point. You can see it's up, it's come up now. It's about 996 millibars, and um, the front is located well offshore, but it's drifted southwest. Now, this is where we start talking about the unnamed hurricane. Um, it's now over part of the Gulf Stream with the uh, the water temperatures near 80 degrees. So at this point, bands of showers and thunderstorms, you know, we call it convection, um, are increasing near the center. And at this point, um, the storm is acquiring what are called tropical characteristics. So it's going from being a typical nor'easter or coastal storm to uh, not quite a tropical storm. It's called a subtropical storm. So the winds weren't at 34 knots yet. So think about this as being opposite of most of our hurricanes and tropical storms here in New England. A lot of time we have a, a tropical storm coming from the south. It comes up to like our latitude here and uh, turns into an ordinary nor'easter. We talked about that, what's called extra tropical transition, but this is the opposite. It's going from being a, what's called a cold core system to a warm core system, which is fairly unusual. So at this point, um, it's turning into what will become a hurricane. And on November 1st, this is kind of a bizarre end to the storm. Um, they actually sent a, a hurricane hunter aircraft in to, to investigate it. And they found, um, again, convection showers and thunderstorms near its center um, to where they can identify a tropical cyclone. And it later did become a hurricane, um, but was not named to avoid confusion. And I'll show a little bit about you know why we did that. Um, so this is why it's also known as the unnamed hurricane. It technically was a hurricane, but was never named. Um, but as Bryce showed, it was on the hurricane chart for 1991. So a little interesting fact about the storm. So here's a couple of satellite pictures just to show its structure. Um, and this was on 1 p.m. on Halloween. You can see it's got a pretty well-organized structure. Um, bands of showers and thunderstorms around the center. You can clearly see an eye developing here. Um, and on November 1st, it's a tropical storm. This is an infrared picture. It's a little harder to see the center, but um, you know, fairly well organized um, bands of showers and storms around its center. And even more interesting is this uh, picture, which was zoomed in during the day on, on November 1st. Um, you can clearly see a, what looks like a hurricane here, almost a buzzsaw circular pattern. Um, these little um, blue hit, um, splotches are lightning, so you can see the showers and thunderstorms and bands all around the center. The pressure at this point was 28.94 inches and it sustained wind of 65 miles an hour. So it was a Category 1 hurricane on November 1st. So after that, um, what happened? Well, it, um, it actually ended up speeding up to the northeast. So it passed over the same area that it did two days before, and it made landfall near Halifax. Uh, as a tropical storm around 9 a.m. on uh, November 2nd. So it actually had a pretty long life cycle, um, drifted down to the southwest, became a hurricane, and then shot up to the northeast and weakened and uh, made landfall as a tropical storm. So why did the storm remain unnamed? That's the question. Um, we know the National Hurricane Center began naming tropical storms and hurricanes in 1950. Um, the hurricane, which developed at the center of what was the dying perfect storm, uh, met all the criteria to be designated as a hurricane. And a track uh, that Bryce showed before is shown on the Hurricane Center's 1991 tracking chart. So why didn't we name it? Well, as we found out, most of the uh, attention was still focused on the massive damage from Maine all the way down to Florida um, caused by the slowly dying storm, especially um, up here in Massachusetts. And it was felt that naming the hurricane would cause major confusion on the part of the media, emergency managers, and the public. Um, thinking another storm is coming. So since the hurricane was expected to be short-lived and primarily um, out over the open ocean and a concern to shipping, uh, it was decided to leave the storm unnamed since it wasn't going to be a threat to land. They didn't want to cause panic or confusion after all the damage that had occurred. So um, the decision was made jointly by several agencies, uh, the Weather Service in particular, um, the National Meteorological Center, which is now known as NSEP, uh, selected forecast offices, including the Boston office, the Navy, and uh, up in Canada, the Maritimes Weather Center of Inve Atmospheric Environment Service of Canada. So uh, this was a joint decision, but certainly the unnamed hurricane kind of brought a bizarre ending to one of the most massive Atlantic storms on record. So there's your trivia for the day. So 
talking about forecasting the storm, many of you may remember uh, one of our meteorologists, Walt Drag, was here for many years, the 80s, the 90s, into the 2000s. And then he moved on to the Philadelphia office before retiring a few years ago. Um, wasn't able to get him in for this. I would have loved to have, have him give his comments. But, um, you know, in his retired life, he likes his, uh, his privacy and whatnot. So, but we did find a lot of um, what he had left us uh, regarding the storm. So um, I do have his thoughts here, and I wanted to share those with you. So back in 1991, uh, the Boston office was located at the Mass Tech Center at Logan Airport. It wasn't in Taunton. It wasn't in Norton, where we are today. It was actually at Logan Airport and roughly where the star is here on the, the airfield. So you can see there was a pretty good view of uh, Boston Harbor and the you can see certainly beyond uh, the inner harbor where you have typically have rough seas. And he said, we can see from the Mass Tech Center office rooftop, and that's where they took the weather observations. Um, there were huge waves breaking against various landmarks in Massachusetts Bay. So um, think out toward Boston Light, uh, for one, where it's exposed ocean. They could see all the waves breaking and uh, really knew something was going on. It was on October 30th at the peak of the storm. So pretty interesting. Now, back in 1991, um, we didn't have the uh, technology we have today. So this was my first year uh, in the weather service. I went from being a student in Boston. I was actually out in Binghamton, New York at the time, just starting my career. And I remember this uh, system here we called AFOS, which was the first automated system in the weather service. And you can see pretty primitive, um, no colors, no animation of graphics. Uh, you just looked at pretty much plan view model data. Uh, we looked at surface maps. We looked at the 500 millibar maps like I showed. Um, and many times, this is a, an image from the Marine Prediction Center, now known as the Ocean Prediction Center. But many offices had, you know, fax charts, maps on the wall. There was, you know, we did, we did some hand analysis and posted them on the wall. Again, primitive computer technology. Um, not like what we have today left on the left here. This is the AWIPS platform at our office. You can see we've got colors. We can loop. We can look at things in 3D. Um, so, you know, we just didn't have that technology back then. There were weather models um, that were reasonably good, but we couldn't um, get to the, you know, we couldn't get to all the detail that we certainly can today. So from Walt's perspective, um, he said, nevertheless, you know, the storm for southern New England and the, and the waters on the ocean was generally well forecast. Um, this was in part due to several days of you know model runs that were um, consistent and reasonably accurate um, you know, at the longer ranges. Um, also in part due to the impressive developments that they saw occurring in the waters south of Nova Scotia on Monday and Tuesday. So think back to what I showed. You know you're looking at those weather maps. You're looking at also at satellite, but also ship reports. So uh, you know for folks in our office who are newer uh, to the weather service, um, you know Bryce, you've been around a while, but newer to forecasting along the coast, I always say, you know, situational awareness is a, is a big thing. We don't just lock into models and go with the models. You have to see what's going on. So you're incorporating, yes, the model data, but you're also giving a lot of weight to satellite data, um, what radar data you have over the ocean, but ship reports. And we rely on those a lot and buoy reports. Um, Walt, you know, had told me they were really seeing these, you know, big increases in wave height and winds on the buoys and, and getting ship reports. So um, you know, when you're out over the open ocean to the east, you don't have a lot of data, so you have to kind of rely on what you have. And often our storms come from the west where we have a lot of information, we have a lot of observations. It's unusual for them to come into the east, um, like our storm is tonight. So, um, you know, credit to the, the forecasters at the time. They did a really good job not having a lot of data to work with. But, uh, you know, watches and warnings were issued uh, pretty successfully for this storm. So I want to show some of the, I went back into the archives and actually found some of the forecast discussions and, um, you know, feel free to read on the left there. They're pretty easy, straightforward to read, some abbreviations. But this was on October 29th, you know, a couple of days before. Um, and this was from Walt. Uh, Walt was working that day and he had a mention of a dangerous ocean storm heading southwest. Um, you can see there was already significant beach erosion um, in Chatham and Nauset Beach. Um, there's a ship report in there of um, a 63-foot wind wave, um, thinking it's probably high, but a sign of the problems upcoming. Um, you know, the same vessel reports swells of 33 feet, and uh, there were two ship reports of 42 foot seas. So they knew something was going on, and um, as Walt writes there, makes us believe that 40 to 45 foot seas are common just east of Georgia's bank, and talks about the AVN model, which is today's GFS, um, brings the storm center near Georgia's bank. Uh, that will be about 7 a.m. on Thursday. 
And if this occurs, major problems, coastal Cape Cod, both inside and outside of the bay. Um, so you can see that, you know, they're, they're, he's already on it and using observations heavily since we don't have a lot more data out there. So moving on in time, this is the discussions from the 30th. Um, and this was the peak of the storm, especially with respect to coastal flooding. This was the, the peak uh, storm surge flooding. And several vessels are reporting 80 knot winds, uh, gusts 92 miles per hour, and seas of 50 to 71 feet, which is just incredible. And at this point, the storm is expected to begin to weaken slowly. But um, again, putting a lot of the emphasis on observations, what's happening. Um, you know, and you can also see on the right there, the discussion there was cold enough uh, there were three reports of sleet, uh, Woburn, Newton Center, and Osterville. So, you know, not much happened inland from this storm, some gusty winds, certainly, but um, actually a little bit of sleet from some cold air aloft and evaporational cooling that was going on. So, um, and even some grass fires in areas uh, that were dry because of strong winds or maybe as Walt writes there, burning leaves. So pretty, pretty interesting. And this is uh, one we found. We have actually, actually have a hand-drawn service analysis, and we used to do these all the time. Um, there, we had a big plotter in the office that would plot the stations, um, and we would go every you know three hours and do a surface analysis like this one. So this was actually from the storm, not during the peak, but um, something to pass along is this little fun fact, and we use this today as kind of a rule, one of our rules of thumb. If you take the difference in pressure, and that's in millibars, between the high to the north, and the storm itself, you'll get an estimate of the wind gust potential in knots. So do a little math. You go from 1044 to 983, that's a difference of 51, and that equates to 50 knot, 51 knot wind gusts. So again, this was not during the peak, but at this point in time, that was probably a pretty good estimate of the, uh, the peak wind gusts that were going on. So try it out. You can try it with the storm we have currently right now. So Walt also commented on uh, how the name Perfect Storm came about, and that was from uh, Bob Case. Um, it was coined in a relay of, of information between uh, then our, what was called the deputy meteorologist in charge, so that was kind of the second in command, um, Bob Case, and the author Sebastian Younger, who wrote the book, The Perfect Storm. Um, so in those discussions, um, Bob described it as it was kind of the perfect storm. You had um, Hurricane Grace, you had a low pressure system coming in and a very deep trough to the west, um, as the three factors, they all came together to create the perfect storm. So um, Sebastian coined that for the book and eventually it was used for the movie. So uh, Bob was, had a very long weather service career, very um, illustrious career too, was the deputy here in Boston for many years. Uh, he moved on to the state college office when they opened that up in the mid nineties and uh, ran that office for many years as the meteorologist in charge. Um, he retired in 2005 and, and sadly passed away in June of 2008. But um, certainly one of the more uh, memorable uh, staff members we had here at the Boston office. And officially, if you look at the uh, Natural Disaster Survey Report, and I'll show a snippet of that a little later on, the official title is the Halloween Nor'easter of 1991. So it's not called the perfect storm in uh, National Weather Service literature, believe it or not. So it goes by that name, it goes by the perfect storm, the unnamed hurricane, or even the no-name storm. So you can take your pick as to your favorite. So this is an excerpt, as I mentioned, from the disaster survey report. And if you check out the, uh, the web address below there, weather.gov slash media slash publications slash assessments. Um, and Bryce, maybe you can toss that into the chat. That would help. Um, you can find a number of these disaster survey reports that are done after significant storms. And if you go down to the 1991 section, you can find this one. So I just found it interesting that uh, back then the structure was a little bit different in the weather service. You had one forecast office, which was Boston and then smaller satellite offices. So if you, if those of you who have been around a while may, may remember weather radio broadcasts from some of them, uh, Providence, Hartford, we had Chatham, which was the former upper air site in Bridgeport. Um, and in those days, there really wasn't, you know, obviously no internet, no email, no social media. Uh, you know, the staff would contact emergency managers. They would, they would get their information through with a weather wire, it was called. They would get these um, bulletins and also through the phone. So, um, you can see that, uh, you know, in the second paragraph here, um, Massachusetts emergency managers, um, you know, said that the, the forecast office did a great job providing advance warning, keeping them up to date. Um, similarly, in Rhode Island, Connecticut, uh, you know, impacts were less severe there, but um, they were pretty much on the phone, uh, you know, 24-7 uh, briefing emergency managers. So 
um, far different than what we do today. We do a lot of our briefings now through email, through um, social media. We do conference calls as needed, um, and it's, this certainly would have risen to that occasion. Uh, now we do them by video uh, in the COVID area too, so it's even a little bit different. But back then it was, you got your information on teletype, and uh, you know, in a big storm, you'd get some phone call briefings, and that was it. So I just found this kind of interesting, and feel free to check uh, check out that website. You can find this storm and many others uh, that have affected the country uh, over the past 30 to 40 years. Hey, Joe. Yeah. It, are you sure? Are we sure that's publicly available? I put in the I put it in the chat, but when I click on it, it, it should it, it should be. Um, I don't think that's an internal site, but um, if people have trouble, shoot me an email, and um, I can find out for sure. I was able to access it from home today, so I think it's publicly available. It should be. Those are, those okay. are public publications, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so let's, we'll finish up and just talk about, could this storm have been worse uh, for the Southern New England coast? And this is, um, again, taking Walt Drag's kind of perspective here. He, he thinks, yeah, um, you know, it definitely spared New England far greater damage. Remember, the center at its closest point passed about 125 miles southeast of Nantucket, and it was weakening. So imagine the storm tracked closer to Southern New England, um, certainly would have brought more wind, more storm surge, more rainfall. And what if it was strengthening? Uh, you know, think about something like the blizzard of 78 that stalled and, and, you know, took its time weakening. It was a strong storm for a long time. Now, the other thing, and this is really kind of eye opening, um, the astronomical tide in Boston on October 30th was 10.2 feet. Now, that gives us roughly about two feet, a little over two feet of wiggle room before we start to get flooding. The flood stage is 12 and a half feet. Now, had this storm occurred a week earlier or a week later, the astronomical high tides were actually about 11 feet, so that we would have started off at a much higher level. So think about this. If we had, we had a storm tide of, of five feet with this storm, uh, roughly, just well, just under, but let's say it was five feet, Boston storm tide on an 11-foot high tide would have been over 16 feet. And you can see that's never occurred since the gauge was installed in the 1930s, the highest being the January bomb cyclone in 2018 at 15.16 feet. So Potentially, if this storm occurred a week earlier or a week later, we would have had all-time record flooding in the city of Boston and even more damage along the coast, areas like Gloucester, Situate, Hull, Revere, um, all the way up and down into Plymouth County and down along Cape Cod. So we lucked out in a way that it occurred between the two astronomical high tides uh, for that time of year. Now, how did it compare to other notable storms? Um, no doubt this was um, you know, a highly unusual benchmark storm for the open waters in the Northwest Atlantic uh, for the latter part of the 20th century. It never made a US landfall, um, but has to be regarded as one of our recent extreme and record setting events uh, for portions of the North Atlantic. And for our mainland, while it was devastating uh, for those you know, who obviously unfortunately lost their lives at sea, uh, for the homes destroyed along the coast as Bryce showed, um, you know, other events in the 20th century had equal or even more severe impact. And I think most folks can remember the, the paralyzing blizzard of 78, along with the you know, major destructive coastal flooding, um, you know, probably is comparable to that of, of the perfect storm. And uh, way back before probably most of our times, the hurricane of 38, uh, you know, the extensive damage from that uh, is probably considered more severe than the coastal, you know, limited impact. Remember, it was right along the immediate coast where the damage was from the perfect storm. So definitely, you know, one of the more notable storms, um, probably not quite rises to the level of the blizzard of 78 or obviously the hurricane of 38, but certainly um, it's high up on, on the list. And just to show one here, the quick comparison, uh, you can see on the table here between the perfect storm, the blizzard of 78 and the 1938 hurricane, uh, the speed was, you know, roughly 25 miles per hour, similar for the blizzard of 78, but that later stalled. And 1938 hurricane was was a rapid mover, 50 miles per hour. Uh, the max winds were certainly less than blizzard of 78 and, and the 1938 hurricane. And again, these are on land, not over the ocean. With the perfect storm, we had a max of 5.5 inches of rain, uh, whereas with the blizzard of 78, you know, upwards of three plus feet of snow, and the 1938 hurricane being a tropical system, 15 inches of rain. Uh, the max storm surge, as you can see, five feet with the perfect storm. I believe that was on uh, Cape Cod. Uh, four feet with the blizzard of 78 in Boston. And the 1930 hurricane had surges of 20 feet up into 
uh, Buzzards Bay in Narragansett Bay. Uh, and this, you can see the storm tide comparison there, just about a foot shy of the blizzard of 78. Didn't have a reading from the 1938 hurricane, but that was not uh, an eastern uh, Massachusetts uh, surge. That was along the south coast. The duration for the perfect storm was three days compared to roughly two days of the blizzard of 78 and just a few hours for the 1938 hurricane. Um, 12 fatalities for the perfect storm, much less than, than either the blizzard of 78 and the 1938 hurricane. And then damage. Um, Walt had calculated this in 1998 dollars, um, less than, you know, it was under a billion, still significant for the perfect storm, but um, certainly more, you know, costly were the blizzard of 70 and the 1938 hurricane. So with that, um, Bryce, we can pause here and um, go through some questions and then we'll get on to our weather briefing. So um, right. I'm going to have some pulled up. Okay. So, so we'll go through some of these. Sure. So we're just going to. Right. Do you want to go take a few? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll go ahead and read, read a couple of them. Um, so first of all, somebody asked, why was it a hurricane if the sustained wind was only about 65 miles per hour? Um, well, it's, yeah, it would have been. Yeah, 60, we, oh, you know what? It might have been. It was 65 knots. We, I think we made it. Say, we had guessed yeah. over 65 miles per hour. So yeah, that, that I believe the sustained wind should have been 65 knots. That's why. Okay. I think we just there had we a units error there, Bryce. <laughs> Easy answer. All right. <clears throat> what, wondering about the conditions at sea with our current storm in particular. Oh, well, actually. Oh, in particular, wind and wave heights in comparison to the perfect storm and blizzard 78 how would they compare to what we're seeing out there now um i would say tonight, I yeah you know along the coast i think we're looking at similar wave heights i, I think we've got 15 to 20 feet just offshore uh, which seems to be in line with what the perfect storm does but offshore we won't see um quite you know those high seas you know 30 40 feet um i think we're looking at more 20 to 30 feet offshore with this one um you know maybe some up to 35 40 feet but Overall, you know, the when we talk about the envelope of winds, Bryce, that you talked about, um, the duration is is less. The you know the area covered by those highest winds is less. Um, so, you know, similar in its track, yeah. it's actually drifting to the west and southwest a little bit. But fortunately, there's no hurricane sitting to our south to kind of energize this, you know, anymore. So, um, I'd say a little bit lower on the winds and the wave heights, especially area wide. Great. Well, uh, I'll go ahead with a similar question then while we're on topic. What's the anticipated lowest pressure in our <clears throat> present storm and how does it compare to the perfect storm? Oh, that's a good question. We'll have to look at that during the briefing. That's so. <laughs> I, 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 that, yeah, we'll save that for the briefing. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'll have to look because I'm not sure myself, but we'll go through and we'll, we'll remember to answer that, Bryce. Okay. Um, somebody says, was there any other context in that year or that time period that created a, a storm of such proportions or indicated that a storm of such proportions would take effect or was it truly the confluence of several systems? Yeah, you know, going back and trying to remember, um, it, it just was, it was just everything came together, you know, perfectly. And that's why Bob Case coined it the perfect storm. Um, you had, you know, a, a weak low offshore that was, um, you know, gener that was being strengthened by that trough moving from Canada, and you really had the energy from Hurricane Grace. That, I think, was a big part of why it strengthened so much, and eventually it cut off from the jet stream. So normally our, you know, our storms come up the coast, they're in and they're out, you know, 12 hours or so. But this one got cut off from the jet stream, it was kind of left to meander, and that's why it eventually started to weaken, but it started to weaken over the Gulf Stream. So there you go. It's like, you know, you're, you're pouring gas. Over you, a you've got a, a fire going out, and all of a sudden someone pours gas on it, and here yeah, you go, exactly. you're re-energizing. So, yeah, I would say it's it's just, you know, it really was a confluence of several systems, everything coming together just right. Perfect. Um, so, next one, was the slow movement of the storm that you showed in the map earlier because of the, a blocking high pressure that caused the storm to retrograde back toward the southwest? Yeah, so that's correct. Um, whenever you have a high, you know, to the north or to the east, it serves as a block. We talk about it all the time. Either it's a blocking ridge or blocking high pressure. And you see that all the time with hurricanes. If you remember, you know, where's the high? Is it off the coast? Will it allow the storm to, to kind of go around the high? Uh, because high pressure um, is much stronger than the low. So the high will act kind of as a wall and not let it move toward it. So, yeah, 
the high was up to the north and uh, blocked the storm and um, wouldn't let it head up toward the Maritimes right away. It actually pushed it a little bit south and southwest. And that's why I did that loop uh, over to the southwest. So that's correct. Uh, what would this situation have looked like if this storm happened a few months later in January or February? Ooh, good question. Uh, you know, well, I don't think you'd have Hurricane Grace there, first of all. Yeah, um, yeah that's true. It would be tough to get the situation. You know, let's say we had two parts available. We had the low and we had a trough digging from the west. You know, it's po it's still possible that, um, that that trough was going to cut off and really give a lot of energy to the storm. So probably not quite as severe, but, um, you know, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't have been a pretty strong nor'easter on its own. Um, with some heavy snow, you know, to the west. But remember, this was pretty far offshore. So I don't think the heavy snow necessarily would have made it here into New England, maybe the Cape and Islands. You know, one of the, the most area. of it probably would have stayed offshore, I would think, um, just looking at the track of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it definitely would have churned up the seas and caused some probably coastal flooding and, and whatnot. Um, at the very least, we probably would have had some minor flooding uh, going on. Right. Um, so wasn't and so let's see if you remember this particular one, Joe. Wasn't the storm of December nineteen ninety two stronger at the Boston longitude? I believe it was, and uh, you know, by coincidence, we'll be having the anniversary of that next year. So <laughs> we will take yeah. a deeper look into that storm. But yes, I believe the the December ninety two um, was was stronger, and that really caused some destructive coastal flooding too. Uh, as I'm sure many folks remember. So, yeah, we'll be adding that uh, to next year's agenda. We'll probably do a whole 30 year, um, you know, retrospective of that. So, um, I'm, you know, I am familiar with the storm, but I've got to really do a lot more research on it. But yes, I believe that was stronger than this one. All right, next one, um, if a situation similar to the perfect storm and its eventual transition to a hurricane happened again today, would the hurricane be unnamed again? Ah, actually, we talked about that in the office today, Bryce. And our, well, we're not all in the office, but we chatted about it. Um, we kind of think it would have been. Um, it would be. So I think what would happen is now we have the ability to do what's called, you know, tropical storm and a post-tropical storm. So even if it turns into a nor'easter, um, we can call it post-tropical or and, and keep the name and keep the warnings up, so we don't have to kind of switch gears in the middle of it. And I think in this case, it would have been. Um, it would have been named a hurricane when it became a hurricane. Um, even if it was staying out over the water, um, because remember, you know, we, we have a lot more, I think we have a lot more shipping uh, and commerce going on today than we did even 30 years ago. So that's important for, uh, you know, for the marine interests uh, and whatnot. So, yeah, I do think it would be named and it would have made, uh, you know, it would have been a hurricane off the Carolinas and it would have uh, made landfall in Nova Scotia as a tropical storm. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that would be the case. Yep. Cool. Um, how many significant storms have retrograded to produce major effects in eastern New England? Ooh, good that question. Tough. Oh, not many. Um, <laughs> it's, it's true. Um, it doesn't happen often. It's kind of happening tonight. Um, but yeah, we you know we see. I would say in like a you know let, let's say like a maybe ten year period you might see one or two of them it doesn't happen a lot because everything has to come together again it has to be kind of cut off from the jet stream in a way uh, to kind of drift the wrong way or have a very strong block up to our north um, to do that so yeah it's certainly unusual um, not unheard of but uh, you know you might see a, a few of these each decade I think that's pretty typical. All right. Um... And did the wind eventually turn offshore at the coast? Did the wind eventually, eventually turn offshore? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, during all of the flooding, um, you know, when, when we had our flooding on, say, the 30th in particular, winds were out of the, the northeast, which is not a good direction because you're bringing all the, the surge right in off the water. And, yeah, later the wind shifted to the north and eventually the northwest and even the west as the system you know, passed up into the Maritimes. So yeah, eventually they did kind of back from Northeast to North to Northwest and eventually West. Cool. Uh, somebody, Tom said, had a, just had a comment that the perfect storm produced and I witnessed the inundation of the Marblehead Causeway. So that's, you know, so he saw some pretty significant uh, flooding there. Yes, um, that's and correct. That, another uh, human uh, kind of, uh, Comment somebody has a little anecdote about the 
the Halloween storm um, set on Cape Cod, took his 10 year old daughter out for trick or treating and uh, wore their rain gear, even though they got wet still. And they were, she was the only kid out there and cleaned up on the candy. So uh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it, was the, still, the it was still going on on Halloween. So um, yeah, good job, cleaned up. Um, yeah, and if, and if folks have any other you know memories, feel free to throw them in there. We, we're happy to share them. So, all right. Should um, we watch? Yeah, let's let's. I was gonna say there's a, a couple more, but we've covered uh, most of the ones that haven't. Some of these have already have, were answered after they were asked in the later in the presentation. So, um, yeah, we can go go on to the briefing. 